Okay, so um, even though my body is physically shutting down, <laughs> my goal is to get through this lecture really quickly so that you aren't missing relevant information. All right. So um, chapter nine, they talk about learning theories. So learning theories explain the social process of how and why people engage in criminal behavior through their learning. So it assumes that our attitudes and behavioral decisions are acquired from, you know, communication after we're born, meaning we're not born that way, we learn it. So virtually all learning theories assume that our attitudes and behaviors are acquired after we, you know, interact with others. So individuals enter the world with what's considered a blank slate, right? So they seek to explain how criminal and non-criminal behavior is learned through cultural values and how people internalize and you know, um, also in relation to who they hang out with and who they associate with, which we'll talk about in a minute. So um, a key feature of learning theories is peers and significant others. So we'll get into that. All right. So first up is differential association theory. Um, this is uh, from Edwin H. Sutherland. So it's considered one of the most influential. Uh, well, he's considered one of the most influential criminologists, but basically in his principles of criminology, in 1939, he introduced differential association theory. So basically, you know, he was interested in explaining how criminal values and attitudes could be culturally transmitted from one generation to the next. And, you know, he used this understanding of classical conditioning to explain how, you know, people understood these, um, how these learning theories affected them. So remember, classical conditioning is the kind of model that was used by Pavlov, Pavlov's dog, right? That idea of associating a noise with a unconditioned stimulus. So you have a conditioned stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus and um, you start to associate. So the example for Pavlov's dogs was that he would ring a bell before he would feed the dog so that the dog, you know, dogs involuntarily salivate in relation to food. And so he associated the, the, the association that he made was the bell. So basically at some point, once he would ring the bell, dogs would begin to salivate before they even got the food because they associated the bell with the food, right? So that's kind of how learning, you know, becomes this association through these stimuli. stimuli. So um, there's different elements of um, differential association theory. So actually there's a lot. And uh, the book gets into it quite a bit, but we're just going to, I'm just going to touch on it a little bit. So he said there was nine specific statements that were elements of differential association theory. So the first is that criminal behavior is learned. So meaning it's not inherited. You have to learn it. You have to be educated in it, right? Um, criminal behavior is learned in interaction with other persons in a process of communication. In most cases, this communication is verbal. However, communication can be nonverbal as well. Um, the principal part of learning of criminal behavior occurs within intimate personal groups. So meaning that, you know, communications between family and, and friends can have more influence than, you know, other people. But at the same time, which we'll talk about in a bit, some people have expanded on this theory and argued that, um, you know, certain things like movies or entertainment media can also have an effect on this. Um, when criminal behavior is learned, the learning includes techniques of committing the crime, which are sometimes very complicated or very simple, and specific direction of motives, drives, and rationalizations and attitudes. So meaning that, you know, criminals learn from others techniques, methods, or motives that are necessary to sustain their behavior. That's kind of that idea that people say sometimes when people get locked up in prison, they become a better criminal. Because it, through differential association theory, the argument is they're around other criminals, so they start to associate, you know, their knowledge into their own. Um, another one of his nine elements is that the specific direction and motives of people are learned from the definitions of the legal codes as favorable or unfavorable. So meaning that people may associate others who define legal codes as rules that should be observed but sometimes not so much. Sometimes they don't respect the law and don't think that it should be followed, right? Like, so like the idea that um, the overwhelming majority of people speed on the freeway, right? Does that mean that we shouldn't have a maximum speed limit? No, it just means that most people don't really see the point in it. 
All right, so a person becomes delinquent because of an excess of definitions favorable to the violation of law over definitions unfavorable, meaning that you basically start to value the criminal behavior more than the fear of getting caught. Um, differential associations may vary in frequency, duration, priority, and intensity. So just meaning that, you know, how often, how long it occurs, whether an individual has developed a strong sense of lawful behavior in early childhood has a lot to do with that. Um, and the process of learning criminal behavior by association with criminal and anti-criminal patterns involves all of the mechanisms that are involved in any other learning. So basically, you learn crime like you learn anything else, right? And so the last is that while criminal behavior is an expression of general needs and values, it is not explained by those general needs and values since non-criminal behavior is an expression of the same needs and values. So basically, you know, he argues that motives, needs, and values for criminal behavior are inadequate because they're also explanations for non-criminal behavior. So for example, needing money is a motivation to steal, right? As well as for a student to get a part-time job. So this, you know, final proposition comes from this idea that you can kind of choose which path you go down there, right? Whether you steal or whether you get a job, depending on your kind of associations that you have with others. All right. So this slide, of course, just kind of sums up all those key things for each theory. So like I said, I'm going to try and breeze through these because my voice is barely going to hold on. All right. So um, when it comes to the concept of differential identification, um, this is Glazer's term. So he claimed it doesn't matter whether the individual had a personal relationship with the reference group. He also argued that this could be expanded to other people. So like, you know, the example here, such as sports heroes, movie stars. So meaning that we get influenced by the larger culture, not just by the people that we interact with in our personal lives. So if someone gets really, you know, has a, a reverence for specific movies, music, TV, video games, whatever, and they're influenced by these things to have different values than the dominant values, that they can kind of have a differential identification with those values. All right, differential reinforcement is just Burgess and Ackers trying to expand upon this, right? So they argued that, you know, um, integrating Sutherland's work with the field of social psychology, meaning adding not just classical conditioning, but operant conditioning and modeling could explain this further. So we'll get into what that means in a minute. <coughs> so basically it assumes that humans are born with an innate capacity for rational decision making. And so again, operant conditioning is what, you know, they talked about. So um, operant conditioning, you know, came from B.F. Skinner which was really looking at how behavior is influenced by reinforcement and punishment, meaning that, you know, a person is not just simply passive, like in classical conditioning where you ring a bell and the dog salivates, but that a person is a proactive player in seeking out rewards and trying to avoid punishment. So, um, you know, he had the kind of very famous the Skinner box where he tested these kind of things out and said that, you know, a that, Behavior is discouraged or weakened via an adverse stimuli. So meaning, if you are positively, if you have, um, you know, positive reinforcement of what you're doing versus if you have a negative reinforcement of what you're doing, that's going to guide your, your behaviors and what you consider to be right and wrong. So a large amount of research has shown that humans do learn attitudes and behaviors best as a mix of punishments and reinforcements. So it really does kind of validate a lot of what they're trying to talk about here. So anyway, when it comes to those propositions, they go into this a lot in the book, so I'll just briefly go over it. But, you know, basically they were looking at how, again, just like the other, um, criminal behavior is learned, but they argued that it had to do with the principles of um, operant conditioning. And that it's learned in both non-social situations that are reinforced and discriminative, and through social interactions where behaviors of others reinforce or discriminate against those behaviors. So basically... The principal part of this learning criminal behavior has to do with, is it reinforced or not, right? Does someone tell you like, oh, that's a good thing, or do they punish that? So learning of criminal behavior is a kind of complicated process of interactions with others and, um, you know, be the reward or punishment kind of model. So they argue that although 
Differential reinforcement incorporates elements of classical conditioning and learning models into its framework. The first part of it clearly states that essential learning mechanisms and social behavior is operant conditioning. So it's vital to understanding what operant conditioning is and how valid that is at all times of an individual's life. And like I said, a lot of research has really looked at the importance of operant conditioning in um, our human development. So again, here's the kind of um, wrap-up of each one that explains how each part of the theory is different. All right, moving on to Bandura's theory of imitation modeling. So Bandura demonstrated through a series of theoretical and experimental studies that a significant amount of learning takes place absent virtually any form of conditioning. So he's, you know, expanding it beyond what the others looked at it. So he argued that per people learn much of their attitudes and behaviors from simply observing the behaviors of others, right? So, you know, he performed experiments in which randomized experimental groups of children watched a video of adults acting aggressively towards a doll, which is basically like one of those, like, it's like a big um, plastic toy that has like a weight at the base and you punch it so it can like kind of swing back and forth. Um, not as popular these days. But anyway, um, so a control group of kids didn't watch the video and then the kids went in and the ones who had watched the video acted far more aggressively towards that doll than the ones who hadn't watched it. So meaning that we do learn and model some of our behavior just from watching others. All right, so um, neutralization is really just um, Sykes and Matza arguing that most criminals are still partially committed to the dominant social order, even if they're socialized differently. So they argue that there's these things called um, techniques of, of neutralization, um, you know, meaning that well, basically, first off, youth are not immersed in a subculture that's committed to either extremes of complete conformity or complete nonconformity. So people tend to drift between the two, right? So that's why sometimes uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about drift theory in a minute. But anyway, um, when it comes to the techniques of neutralization, there's a few of those. And again, they go into it in the book. The first is denial of responsibility. So meaning that, uh, you know, the first part is just claiming that deviant acts are an accident, right? So individuals may claim that forces outside of themselves are why something happened. So it wasn't my fault, right? Um, it was because of this other person or because of this situation that this happened, right? Another one is denial of injury. So criminals may evaluate the wrong, be wrongful behavior in terms of whether or not anyone was hurt. Right? So people will say, like, oh, it was a prank, it's not a big deal, or I stole that car, but it didn't hurt anybody. Right? Another is denial of the victim. While, you know, criminals may accept the responsibility for the act that they did, they tend to neutralize the actions as being a rightful retaliation against a person. So, like, let's say, um, you know, if, if vandalism is revenge on an unfair, you know, teacher or shoplifting is retaliation against a crooked store owner, right? That they're still blaming the other person as the cause for their own criminal behavior. Um, and then there's condemnation of the condemners, which just means that criminals often shift the focus of attention from their acts to the motives and behaviors of those who disapprove of their actions, right? So for instance, one may claim that police are corrupt or that teachers show favoritism, parents take it out on their kids, etc. But really, it's just a neutralizing way to kind of absolve yourself of blame. And then there's the appeal to higher loyalties, meaning that criminals may sacrifice the rules of larger society for the rules of the smaller groups to which that person belongs, such as a gang or a peer group. So meaning that they don't necessarily deviate because they reject the norms of larger society, more just because they're more loyal to this group, meaning like, I didn't want to commit that crime, but I had to help my friend. Right? Those kind of things. So anyway, um, it kind of, you know, studies started to look at this and try to um, look at how corporate crimes have identified these um, two additional techniques, which are a defense of necessity and the metaphor of ledger. So basically, defense of necessity just implies that an individual should not feel shame or guilt if they do something immoral as long as the behavior was perceived as necessary, right? Well, I had to do it. Doesn't matter if it's right or wrong, it had to be done, right? Or the metaphor of the ledger is essentially the belief that an individual or group has done so much good 
that they're entitled to mess up by doing something illegal. Meaning like, well, I mean, I'm so charitable. I've done all these good things. Well, sure, I, you know, cheated all my taxes or whatever it is. Um, because, you know, they they feel like, well, I've already done more good than I've done harm. So anyway, that's kind of that. Here's the wrap up of that one as well. And remember, I'm going to give you guys a non-audio version of this to review in your own time. All right, so control theories assume that all people would naturally commit crimes if it wasn't for restraints on the selfish tendencies that existed in the individual. And control theorists rhetorically ask, what is it about society, human interaction, and other factors that cause people to not act on their natural impulses? So again, natural impulses is the assumption that we're just naturally criminal. This A lot of this comes from Hobbes, which is why I put that little... Hobbes dude from Calvin and Hobbes on here. Anyway, um, so Hobbes, um, not my favorite theorist, but whatever. He um, claimed that the natural state of humanity was greediness and self-centeredness, meaning like if you didn't have laws and rules, people would just fight each other. It would be chaos, right? That we're just naturally bad. We have to be controlled, right? We're self-centered. So he argued that by creating a society and forming binding contracts, it would alleviate the chaos by deterring individuals from violating other people's rights. So Durkheim kind of expanded on this into his idea of collective conscience. So first, you know, he basically just, he suggested that humans have no internal mechanisms to let them know when they are fulfilled. So he coined the term autom automatic uh, spontaneity and awakened reflection to kind of understand this. So automatic spontaneity can be understood with reference to animals, eating habits. So for example, um, animals stop eating when they're full and they're content until they're hungry again. So they don't start hunting right after they've filled their stomachs. They wait until they're hungry again. In contrast, awakened reflection concerns the fact that humans do not have an internal regulatory mechanism. So, because people tend to acquire resources beyond what's immediately required. So, we don't wait until the next time we're hungry to then go out and hunt. We fill our fridges, right? We fill our supermarkets. We, we plan ahead, right? So, this is also kind of why Durkheim said uh, animals can't commit suicide. That was actually part of that, too, was this idea that, like, you know, sometimes, like, like if an owner dies and the dog ends up starving themselves, um... It's not necessarily because the dog knows it's going to die. It's starving because it's sad, right? So that's just a reflection of its depression or its mourning for the fact that its owner is dead, right? But not having the foresight of the future, you don't realize that you're not eating is going to result in your death. Anyway, that's not really part of this, but I just, I love that part. But anyway, so one of the primary elements of this regulatory force is what's called the collective conscience, which is the extent of similarity of likenesses that people share in the culture. So, you know, he argues that it's this regulatory force because people want to get along, they want to unite, and that can be a way to kind of control them and keep them together. All right. And so, of course, Freud also, this guy, um, you know, he proposed that individuals are all born with tendencies to be selfish. <clears throat> so, you know, his example was the id, the ego, and the superego. So the id is what he considers the domain of the psyche, right, that we... Basically, um, you know, that's just like our prime mortal forces of the id is your basic biological drives, right? That he also assumed that this selfish tendency must be countered by controls from the development of a su superego. So basically, the superego becomes kind of like society's value system. And the ego is the kind of middle ground between the two right? Your basic drives, your desires, and what society is telling you are like that little Jiminy Cricket conscience, right? All right, so, con you know, con continuing on this one, um, Reese's control theory was one of the first control theories that claimed that delinquency was a consequence of weak controls that resulted in a weak ego or superego controls among juvenile um, populations. So Reese assumed there was no explicit motivation for a delinquent act and that delinquency was a consequence of just those weak controls. So the family was seen as the primary source through which deviance predisposed or predispositions were discovered. 
So meaning a sound family environment provides an individual's needs and emotional bonds that are important to preventing them from committing crimes. So the ability to restrain one's impulses and delay gratification was also important to his research, right? The idea of putting off something today for tomorrow, which I wanted to include the video, but I don't have time, of the marshmallow test that kind of tests this out that they do um, in child development research uh, for learning theories um, on children, which is really adorable, where they basically leave like a marshmallow in front of a kid and then tell them if they don't eat that marshmallow, that they can get more marshmallows later, right? And almost every kid just eats the marshmallow immediately because kids have very low self-control. Okay, when it comes to Toby's concept of stake or um, stake in conformity, he's arguing that individuals are more inclined to act on their natural inclinations when the controls on them are weak. So he emphasized the concept of a stake in conformity that supposedly prevents most people from committing crimes. So the stake of conformity he's referring to is the extent to which individuals have investment in the conventional society. So one feature of his theory is the emphasis on peer influences in terms of motivating and inhibiting antisocial behavior, depending on whether most of the peers have low or high stakes of conformity. So his stake of conformity has been used as an effective and subsequent control theory of crime to kind of understand how much the peer can kind of lead us or what we now call peer pressure. All right, so early control theories. Um, the first is Nye's control theory, um, where he just basically said there's no significant positive force that causes delinquency because antisocial tendencies are universal. So he says there's actually three primary components of control. There's internal control, which is formed through social interactions. And so this is where you kind of get that socialization of a conscience that's going to stop you from doing bad stuff. There's direct control, which is, you know, just controlling a person's actions, whether or not they have the opportunity to commit a deviant act. So this can include also after someone has done an act, so sanctions like jail, ridicule, right? Um, those kind of things. And indirect control which occurs when individuals are strongly attached to their early caregivers, meaning that they know that, like, okay, that's kind of that thing going back to what we talked about with different theories, how um, if, you, if you're afraid, like, oh, my mom's going to be so pissed if I get arrested, right? That would be indirect control because your mom's not there telling you right now you can't do this, but you're afraid of what it will, you know, what she'll think later. Um, Reckless's containment theory emphasizes both inner containment and outer containment, which is viewed as internal or external controls, really. So, you know, Reckless um, identified predictive factors that push and or pull individuals towards antisocial behavior. So individuals can be pushed into delinquency by their social environment, such as a lack of opportunities for education or employment, like we've been talking about with Code of the Street. And he also pointed out some individual factors, such as a brain disorder, risk-taking personalities, those kind of things, but that some individuals can also be pulled into criminal activity by hanging out with delinquent peers, watching too much violence on TV, associating with negative associations, those kind of things. So um, containment theory proposes that extra pushes and pulls can motivate people to commit crime. So it's important to understand the, the motivations of those things. All right, so again, this is just the kind of wrap up of what we we're just talking about. All right, so drift theory. Um, basically, Matza argues that individuals offend at certain times in their life when their social controls are weak, such as um, not having parental supervision, not being employed, right? Those kind of things. So that's kind of going back to that idea that most people commit crime in their teens or early 20s. That makes sense to his theory that if you aren't having that much parental supervision in your teens versus in your early childhood, and if you don't have like the kind of job you have when you're in high school is probably not like a career that you're worried about losing, right? Versus if you're like in your 40s and, you know, your your kids and your family relies on that income. So basically, you know, he, he came up with this, um, you know, this idea that there's a degree of determinism um, of human behavior. So he called it soft determinism. <laughs> So soft determinism is what he considers the gray area between free will and determinism. So he argues that when supervision is absent and ties are minimal, the majority of individuals are the most free to do whatever they want. And it's during these times that people have few ties that they're more likely to 
result in delinquency. So he also talked about how um, individuals do not reject the conventional normative structure. So meaning mo most offending is based on neutralizing or adhering to subterranean values. They've been socialized to as a means of circumventing conventional values. So it's not as if they're breaking their values. They just have different values than the law. Um, when it comes to much of the offending, um, like, he's, like he said, it's based on adhering to that, right? Into, um, yeah. So again, here's a wrap-up of drift theory here. All right, so the more modern social control theory is um, Hershey's social bonding. Um, so Hershey's, you know, this is probably the most influential social control theory. So it takes an assumption from Durkheim that we're all animals and so we're, you know, naturally capable of committing uh, criminal acts. So, however, he acknowledges that most humans can be adequately socialized to not commit crimes, right? That you're mostly bonded to conventional entities such as, you know, schools, families, communities. So the stronger a person is bonded to conventional society, the less prone they are to engaging in crime. More specifically, the stronger the social bond, the less likely that they'll commit any criminal offenses. So there's four elements of this bond theory. The first is attachment. So this is the affectionate bonds between an individual and his or her significant others, like how close someone is. Commitment, so the investment that a person has within conventional society. So again, that stake of conformity kind of thing. Um, involvement, the amount of time one spends in conventional activities. Um, the assumption that time spent in constructive activities will reduce time devoted to illegal behaviors. And so this has, again, in research, that third element of involvement has really panned out. That's why there's um, things such as at-risk youth programs, because they assume that by keeping youth that are at risk of criminal delinquency engaged in some sort of involved, like, societally approved behavior that they're not going to commit crimes because they're too busy being associated with something positive. And the last one is belief, which has generally been interpreted as the moral belief of laws and society. So, you know, this is the one that also consistently supports the aspects, that, that, the aspects of the social bond. So, you know, it's been tested by a lot of research and it's extremely valid. So that one's, um, you know, very important to criminological theory. So again, the idea that it's made up of four elements, blah, blah, blah. Okay, integrated control theories. Um, first is uh, Tittle's uh, control balance theory, which argues that the amount of control to which one is subjected and the amount of control to which one can exercise determines the probability of deviance occurring. So basically, the balance between these two types of control, he argues, can even predict the type of behavior that's likely to be committed. So a person is least likely to offend when he or she has a balance of controlling and being controlled. So, you know, if people are more controlled, he calls this a controlled deficit. Um, if people are less controlled, it's a control surplus. Anyway, so basically he argues that there has to be this balance. Otherwise, if the balance shifts, that person is more likely to engage in criminality. All right, so for Hagen's power control theory... Um, the primary focus of this theory is on the level of patriarchal attitudes in the structure of the household, which are influenced by parental positions in the workforce. So basically, power control theory assumes that in households where the mother and father have relatively similar levels of power at work, mothers will be less likely to exert control upon their daughters. Um, and so these balanced households will be less likely to experience gender differences in the criminal offending of their children. So, um, however, though, on the other side of that, households in which mothers and fathers have dissimilar levels of power in the workforce, um, or what they call unbalanced households, are more likely to suppress criminal activity in their daughters, but additionally, they will teach assertiveness, risky behaviors, and those things to their male children. So just kind of meaning, like, if you are in a situation where um, you see the roles of your parents as very gendered and different, then... Um, there's more likelihood that they're going to control the behaviors of their daughter much more so than the behaviors of their son. Again, there's that. Okay. Um, general theory of crime, low self-control. So Gottfried and Hershey kind of came together to offer the general theory of crime, 
that assumes that individuals are born predisposed towards those selfish, self-centered activities, just like Hobbes was saying, and that only effective child rearing and socialization can create self-control among people. But the problem is that their theory assumes that self-control must be established by age 10. And then if it hasn't formed by that time, then they're going to exhibit low self-control. Right? So the general theory of crime assumes people can control themselves um, to some degree, meaning that they have control over their own decisions within certain limitations, so they are able to kind of control their behaviors. So again, this is one of the most valid theories of crime. Um, it's been tested a lot of times. And so, um, you know, they, they talk about the idea of um, personality traits also being related to this, like who the person is themselves is going to relate to this. So um, actually, you know, they talk about it in the book, some studies that looked at this specifically, how low self-control um, can influence, you know, certain kinds of crimes. Like, for example, um, low self-control leads to a lot of drunk driving, right? So the personality of like, no, I'm fine, I can drive, um, that's not universal, right? Um, also, when it comes to something like maybe shoplifting, right, that's often related to the pleasure that people get from the crime itself. So that's why you see those like crazy rich celebrities doing that, even though they could afford everything in the store, they still decide to steal stuff. It's because of the, the, the rush that they're getting from it. They have a low self-control of their behaviors and they value that, that thrill that they get over the fear of, you know, the law basically. So anyway, um, yeah, I hope this helped.